All right, Nightmare Success listeners, we're back. And, uh, you know, we always talk about on this show what happens when your worst fear becomes your reality. How do you adapt? How do you survive? Do I have a treat for you guys? It's a first for me. This is a story about someone who, you know, had a life, you know, it was, it was on the streets, it's drug dealing. He, he went to juvenile for four years, went to prison in Leavenworth for three years, grew up in Leavenworth. And now Jermaine Wilson is the mayor of Leavenworth. I can't wait to get into this story. Uh, and before we do that, I want to introduce our new sponsor for the show, Auto Plaza Direct. And, you know, who likes walking around for a couple of weekends on car lots, looking for a car? You finally find a car, and then you got to go into that dealership for four to five hours. It's kind of like going to the dentist. Well, there's a better way. There's a way, better way to take away all that pain for getting a car. It's called Auto Plaza Direct. They are your personal car concierge. Just tell them the car you want what you can pay, and they'll go find that car for you. They'll negotiate your best price and deliver that car to you. Go to autoplazadirect.com to get started with your personal car concierge. The new hassle-free way, the new car buying experience you deserve, Auto Plaza Direct. Tell them Brent from Nightmare Success sent you. Okay, folks, here we are. Jermaine Wilson, welcome, my man. Hey, how you doing, sir? I'm doing good. So I want to give a shout out to Jim Clark because Jim Clark actually uh, connected us all up. So Jim, and Jim was my first guest on Nightmare Success over a year ago. So uh, it's all full circle. So Jermaine, man, what a story. You know, to be able, and we talk about, you know, when you go through your worst fear, how you handle it, how you survive, how you adapt, but what you've been able to do after you've gotten through all that is is really a Incredible. And I, I want to go back a little bit so people can understand where you came from. Um, what was life? Because you grew up in Leavenworth. Am I correct about that? Correct. Yes, sir. So what was life for you like growing up in Leavenworth, Kansas? Yeah. As a kid. So, yeah. So just kind of going back to the beginning, I was uh, actually born in a small town called Kennett, Missouri, uh, the mm -hmm. hometown of Cheryl Crow. Yes, and, it is. Uh, yeah. I went to Mizzou. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, my dad was in and out of prison. Uh, you know, our neighborhood was drug infested. And my mother, she was 20 years old with four children. I was the, uh, the, the youngest child. And so she just looked around and one day she just said she needed something different. I had a uh, uncle who served in the army in Leavenworth, Kansas, and he had informed my mom about Leavenworth, and so she just wanted something new. And so when she uh, packed up all of her belongings and her children, she moved us to Leavenworth. Uh, she didn't realize the apartment complex uh, that we were moving into uh, was the ghetto. You know, it was low yeah. government housing area, uh, but you know that's that's one part of it. But once yeah. you live in that community, you realize like the crime, the drugs, uh, the poverty. It was really having a huge impact on so many people's lives. And as kids growing up, uh, we were exposed to this. And my mom was sure. working two jobs, you know, trying to make ends meet. But every time she would leave, you know, my brother and I, uh, you know, we snuck around the neighborhood, and that was the time that we got exposed uh, to what drugs were, gunshots, violence. And so we were accustomed to that and it became our norm every single day. Jermaine, how old would you have been in that time period when you were just kind of sneaking out, going around the neighborhood when seeing those type of things? And I was five years old. Oh my gosh, man. That's a yeah. lot for a five-year-old to see. Yeah. And my brother was seven years old. And so I was like the, the young buck on the block. And so, you know, everyone was like, hey, let me go ahead and turn him on to this and thinking it was cool, but not realizing uh, how detriment it was and how much of an impact it was going to have on my life. Well, and I'm sure, you know, going into a new place, yeah. not knowing very many people, and then that being what's going on in the streets, I'm sure it felt like they were, you know, kind of taking you in. You were becoming part of something It probably didn't yeah. feel that strange you were you're getting connected to the neighborhood so jimmy tell me like when things start as you start getting older uh -huh. um and like what was school like for you what were you involved in school was it a, was it a, an escape for you what what 
how did that world play in for you? Yeah, you so up? so growing up, I was short, and I always had this insecurity about myself just because I never could fit into uh, the popular group. And so, therefore, I would always, you know, try to be a class clown, end up getting kicked out of school just because I wanted to seek that attention and the approval amongst my peers. Uh, but it was always difficult for me to adapt in school because every single year uh, we had to move just because my mom couldn't afford to rent or yeah. the, the owner of the house refused to, you know, renew the lease. And so with that, at all the children, I was the one that always had to switch schools every single year. And this happened all the way into middle school. And by the time I was in middle school, that's when I got introduced to uh, doing drugs and also committing crimes. So when that started to happen, and, and I can't imagine that would have been really difficult to move as a kid at that age, yeah. just from school district to school district and, and get it to a new school. Um, when you, because I think, if I, am I right that, that when you got caught as a kid, I don't know how old you were, but mm -hmm. you went through like three or four years of being in that system. Yeah, correct. The first time I committed a, 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 a broken house at the age of 12 years old, I was okay. given diversion. Uh, and then I continued that life of crime just because of the attention uh, I received from my peers at school. They embraced me. I got a chance to start hanging around the older kids. They thought it was cool. Uh, and I continued that life of crime. And at the age of 15, I committed a robbery charge, was sentenced to two years in juvenile corrections. Uh, then, you know, I started thinking about the movie Escape from Alcatraz. I thought it was a <laughs> Good idea to try to escape. I tried to escape, failed in the attempt, and was sentenced to an additional two years. So from 15 to 19 years old, I gave up my entire juvenile teenage years uh, just because I wanted to fit in and be part of the, the popular group. Uh, I lost myself trying to be like everybody else. And during my time of incarceration and juvenile corrections, you know, I adapted to my environment. I got involved up into the gang lifestyle. Yeah, so I, I'm curious at 15 years old to uh, 19 years old age. I mean, it's such an impressionable age, and you're, you're. In, what what were you thinking being in that environment? How were you getting by being in an environment like that? I don't even well, think people. I, I don't even think most people know what juvenile detention is even like. Yeah, and so just imagine you got a bunch of teenagers, you know, testosterone through the roof. Uh, yeah. Everybody got a chip on their shoulder. And for me, just because I knew that I was going to have a hard time, just because, you know, I'm still short, immediately I learned how to fight. And so my fears turned into aggression. And any time mm -hmm. that I was faced with any opposition or anyone tried to, uh, as we would use the term, check me, immediately I will fight. And so with me being the first one, always ready to fight, my reputation started to grow. And as my reputation grew, that respect for my name started to increase as well. And that's when, you know, I started making a name for myself, even though it was negative, uh, but I used that as a way to protect myself. Yeah, and I think that's something that's a good point too, is that leadership can be bad and good. I mean, Correct. but you're, what what you have inside you, people will follow. Yep. And and it, and it kind of leads to where you are today because you know that the, you 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 flipped the script and, and started using those leadership qualities in a way that really benefited the good. So you get out. Mm -hmm. uh, how does this affect your mom and that whole world with with the family? Is it is she? How are you still connected to all that? How's it working? Yeah, so so my mom would still come up and visit me whenever I wasn't in segregation. And I kid you not, this I know God is real. Every time one of her children got locked up, my mom had another baby. Oh and my gosh. I, yeah, my sister got locked up, my brother got locked up, and I was locked up. And during those four years, my mother had three different children. And I realized, you know, uh, just so the babies came so she wouldn't have to be depressed and always thinking about us. I yeah. truly believe that. Uh, but she never gave up on us. She continued to pray for us. Uh, she continued to provide for us whenever we were in need. She gave us resources. Uh, so that love and connection was there. My dad had came back in the picture as well. And, you know, yeah. he would visit. It was just always tough. And my mom knew that I was a good child just yeah. because, you know, she, she knows the children. 
Uh, yeah. But she knew that I was always trying to fit in. And that's what made it difficult and challenging for me in my life. But she kept saying, son, I'm not going to give up on you. She didn't give I, up on you. Yeah, No, she didn't. And so when that time came for me to get released from juvie, uh, she was there to pick me up. Her and my father was. And they took yeah. me back to, to Leavenworth. So, Jermaine, when you got out of that world, how long did you last in the outside world before you got into your own nightmare again? Man, I was only at 18 months. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, when I, oh, came, man. when I came home, uh, I had made up in my mind that I was going to become one of the biggest drug dealers because I felt like that time that was given to me in juvenile, those four years, I felt like my time was robbed from me. I felt yeah. like I didn't deserve it. And so I had made up in my mind that I was going to make up for lost time, not realizing it was going to cost me more time. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to my old neighborhood. By this time, you're not going to live on my own. I'm 19 years old. I ain't no way in the world I'm about to stay with my mom and dad. And so I went back to that same environment, that environment that taught me life of crime is okay. Being disrespectful yeah. to your parents is okay. And the individuals who didn't write me, who didn't put no money on my book, I consider these individuals still to be my friends because yeah. they showed me what I thought was true love, but it was really fake love. They turned me on to the crack cocaine game. And, you know, I think that so many times on here, Jermaine, we've had stories like this, you know, it's people, places, and things, you know, and, and if you don't change your people, places, and things, then it's so easy to stay. It's almost like handcuffs that bring you back. Yep. You can't set yourself free because you're, you're in a, you're in an environment that's comfortable. It's something that, you know, changing people, places, and things is a thing that's really hard because you, you have to step out of that comfort zone. Correct. So when you, you got back into this and these people feel like your friends, but they're not really your friends, but it mm -hmm. feels like family. Uh, walk me through the nightmare of getting caught again after 18 months and what's going through your mind. So God blessed me with the sun. And, you know, during the time that I'm hustling, I was with my childhood girlfriend. I got a baby now. And in my mind, you know, I'm thinking like, man, I don't want my son to live this life that I'm living. So what am I going to do? Well, I have to hustle hard. I got to make more money. I got to make sure that he don't live a life of crime and poverty. So therefore, you know, I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing on a higher scale. But it was just the wrongful thinking because my girl was telling me to stop. Your son needs your time, not your money. But yeah. I didn't take heed to that. And because I wasn't mature enough uh, to understand where she was coming from, you know, I just started focusing on, you know, trafficking, uh, you know, instead because it got too hot for me. 11 words started going to different states. Uh, mm -hmm. But man, deep down, when I would go to sleep at night, man, I'd cry just because I was feeling empty inside. I was like, man, like I really want to quit, but I don't know how to quit. And I kid you not, I knew that I was going to get locked up and it was just a matter of time. And I was you feel it for that time to come just so I could quit. Because I felt like if I would have quit, I would have been letting everybody down that was connected yeah. to me, that I was supporting. And I felt like they needed me. Yeah. So you, so when you get hit, yep. is, it a, is it a knock down the door, we've got you, or is it an investigation that goes on and you just feel it's going on and someday they just tell you to come down and, and they take you? Yeah, man. So it was an investigation that was going on and I never figured the day when I was leaving the apartment complex, uh, my girl was saying like, hey, your son wants you. He's crying on the floor, wanted me to pick him up. She's saying, don't leave. I said, this is my last time. And I'll be back. Last time. Run. Well, last run. When I left, man, didn't realize the cops were waiting on me. Uh, they seen me. They were actually at a call. They had a group of uh, officers at this one particular house. They see my vehicle and they just knew that I had everything on me. And they followed me a couple of blocks down the street. And I never forget the day they hit their sirens and pulled me over, found everything in the vehicle. Wow. So what's what's going through your mind, Jermaine? Because you know this is big. This is, you know, that, that doesn't happen every day. <laughs> so I'm like, man, this is it. They 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 yeah. got me. And you know, when they lock me up and in my mind, I'm like, man, I gotta, I gotta get out, I gotta move this, I gotta move that. So 
I yeah. bond out. My girlfriend comes and bonds me out, and I go back to doing the same thing. Oh no! But not realizing <laughs> this case is pending. Yeah. Not realizing this case is pending, and I only did that for a few more months, man, before I ended up getting busted in a different state with more drugs, and they shipped me back to Leavenworth, and that's when I knew that it was over. Yeah. So when you get into this, do you have, what kind of representation do you have? You have a public defender? Do you have- I'm not, like, well, no? I, I had a little bit of money saved up. And okay, so, all right, uh, all right. The money that I saved, you know, you realize like, man, like all of this is for nothing because now I got to yeah. use to fight my case. All this, to, yeah, for defense, exactly. Yeah, and so, you know, I, uh, I, I got a lawyer, uh, you know, he was representing me. Uh, the problem was it was just too much uh, against me. You know yeah. what I mean? And now yeah. I get busted in a different state and now I'm trying to, you know, go for a, a drug rehabilitation, trying to use the excuse as if I got a drug problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was not the case. And when I realized, like, if I did not take the plea and I try to go to trial, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be spending more time, uh, you know, than than actually what I would have, you know, if I would have just took it, the plea. And I I think, this time if I took the plea. Yeah, and Jermaine, I think it's one of those things where people don't even really understand that process of, of yeah. coming to grips with the plea. Cause I was just talking to a guy the other day and he's, he's been out, he's on probation, but he got into another situation that he was been fighting and um, he really wanted to fight it. But when it came down to it, he really was scared about going back into that courtroom. Yeah. And so he took a lesser plea. He's going to be on probation and, and he'll get, but I think the scariness of looking at additional time or going back to prison, that's why you see, so many, you know, that you know, ninety-five percent of the cases that plea out because Correct. you look at the scary, you know, the scary look of it, and especially if you've been to prison, you know, you can survive prison, but you certainly don't want to go back. Correct, correct, and especially if you knew you're guilty. So I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna waste time trying to fight this case, and knowing that I'm gonna get more. Knowing time that you're guilty, right? Take right, the plea, right. knowing that I'm guilty, because. I, you know, I told him myself, you know what I mean? There was no one else involved in my case. So this all falls on me. So this is this is kind of interesting, though, because you you end up going to prison basically in your hometown. Yeah. Uh, what's that like? I mean, did, did you when you when you walk through those gates, did you know and connect with people that you knew from the street? Yeah. So, so I, I don't know how familiar you are with the state prison. So when I first got locked up, I was in RDU in El Dorado. Then they shipped me to Norton, which was five hours away from Leavenworth. Okay. And they said, the only way you're going to get out of Norton is through fighting or programming. And I heard about the program prison fellowship. And that's when I was like, man, you know, that's in Lansing. And so I can get closer to home. So I yeah. signed up for the program. I was in Norton for three weeks. When I went to uh, back to Lansing, Man, I knew everybody. The yeah. guards I went to school with, you know, I was well known in my community. My nickname, Too Short. And it's like, man, what's up, <laughs> man? Welcome here. Uh, but the program is in the max facility. And so yeah. I'm just like, this is like, what in the world's going on? But I met my hometown. So immediately those negative thoughts start running through my sure. mind. And I could do this. I could do this. Yeah. I know everybody here. And so, uh, you know, it, it took a couple of months, man, for me to calm down and not not pursue uh, those those negative thoughts that was running through my mind. Well, Jermaine, that had to be a conscious effort on your part, though, because it would have been easy for you to yeah. fall into that. What what was the strategy in your mind to say, no, I'm not going that way? Man, one, I was sober minded Two, I realized while I was sitting in my cell one day. If I don't change my life, my son's going to follow in the same footsteps. The legacy that's been handed down from generation to generation within my family has always been crime, drugs, and incarceration. And so I'm sitting in my cell and I'm just crying. And I'm like, God, like, if, if you real, like, come into my life, I want something different. I'm tired of being a loser. I'm tired of being a failure. I'm, I don't want to be a mistake. And I don't want my son to follow in the same footsteps that, that I've already laid. What am I going to do different? And that's when I realized that I have to change my life because kids not going to do what you tell them to do. They're going to do exactly what they see. So if I can be that that example, that positive example for my son and I start walking out the right path, then he's going to see exactly what it takes to do the right thing because his dad is leading the way. And I just had to start with myself. 
Wow, that is so powerful. And you know, it, it's so, it's always so interesting to me how a moment will, and you, in that moment, I, I'm sure is vivid to you, yeah. how you just explained it. It's almost like that rock bottom moment almost takes you down yeah. to your soul that this is, uh, this is the time, this is where I break the mold. This is, you know, you, what, how you explained that, Jermaine, so powerful because you had to completely break away from everything that had always been. Yeah. And step into nothing that had been. Correct. And that became your new world. So as you changed your mindset in prison, how did that change your world in prison? Like, did you start hanging out with different people? Did yeah. you start doing different things? What, how did that work? Yeah, so I really started hanging out with the older individuals and a lot of them were lifers. Uh, yeah. You know, they're never going to get a chance to see daylight again. And they felt like they missed the opportunity with their own children. Yes. And they said, brother, man, you remind me so much of my son. You're around their age. All this information and wisdom and knowledge that I have inside of me that I'm not able to give to them, I'm going to give to you. Mm. And at that moment, I just didn't listen to the knowledge. I began to apply it. And that's when the wisdom started to take place in my life. You know, wisdom is knowledge being applied. So yes. I started stop using profanity. You know, I started going to church. I started really studying my Bible. I started reading, reading self-help books. I just became mm -hmm. disciplined and my thinking started to change. Once my thinking began to change, my outlook began to change. And when my outlook changed, man, I started having different outcomes of life. I no longer entertained the negative conversations. I literally started talking about things that I was going to do once I got out, not mm -hmm. the things that I used to do. And so, you know, life and death is in a power of the tongue. I started speaking, uh, you know, positive things into my life. And that's when it really started to happen and transform my life. And when my girlfriend seen the difference in my life, she came back in my life. My son came back in my life. Everything then, started going. Yeah. Back. And so I'm like, man, I'm doing the right thing. You know, I'm serving God. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm being a positive role model in prison. Man, let me keep this up because this is uh, the reward. It feels is good. Better. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? feels good. Yeah, and it, and it does feel good. And that feeling that's inside of you, you know, it becomes contagious. And when people really start to gravitate to you because of the positive energy inside of you, yeah. you realize like, man, I can lead people to do positive things instead of negative things. Yeah, and see, you would always let. It was yeah. just that you, you applied this new you and started leading towards the good and make a difference. And, and this is a story, you know, Jermaine, I didn't say this in the beginning, but, you know, this has been, you've been on Good Morning America, you've been on CBS yeah. Morning Show. There, there's a reason why, though. There, People love to see, because I think it's because they hope it in themselves. And right. you, your story inspires hope that you came from, and you had love from your parents, you had love from your mom, but the streets and where you were getting accepted and, and what you were going to do with your life that became your life Correct. and to break. But the, the inspiring thing about it, I think what people really like about a story like yours is, is that you had that moment. You knew you didn't want that. You took wisdom, you took mentorship and you just broke away. And what you've done with your life since then is what people hope for. You know, that's, Correct. and I think that's why your story is, it resonates so well with all the people you go out and speak with, you, when I hear your story, I am inspired. And, and the fact that you're able to use that and get people to, uh, to get there, you know, so many things in our, our world right now are all the bad stuff. You know, it's, it's, you turn on the TV, everything's bad. All the world's going, you know, to hell in a handbasket. People are looking for stories like yours because they want to be inspired by the hope of change. So Jermaine, tell me this. So all this starts happening good. You're living a different life in prison. You start getting close to the door, knowing that you're going to get out. What's going through your mind in that world, in your mind, thinking, I'm getting close to getting out? Man, I really started to get excited. I wasn't uh, anxious. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't worried. Man, I was excited because I'm like, man, I'm really going to make a positive impact on my community. And, and I just started to tap off into my gift. I have the ability to communicate, the ability to connect to people and make people feel good. So when those prison doors opened up, you know, 
man, I, I literally, everything that I had planned and prepared, I started to implement the first day that I was out. I started I to it. work my action plan. It wasn't like, hey, take me home. We about to celebrate. No, take me to my PO. Take me to the workforce uh, development department. So I get yeah. these food stamps, all the resources that was available and free to me. I made sure that I did that. And then this, I went home and chilled and relaxed with my son and with my son's mother. Day two, hey, started looking for jobs. I knew that that I had no time to waste because yeah. you know the idle times that was playground, and I had made up in my mind that man, I'm preparing for success, so therefore I need to take these steps that's going to lead me to the direction and the goals that I'm trying to achieve. And it took me three weeks to find employment, but I worked it every single day. You know, even when I heard individuals tell me no, I realized, man, no doesn't mean I'm not qualified. It simply means next opportunity. And yes. so I found the right opportunity. I love that. I don't want to, I don't want to gloss over what you just said. I no mean, means good. next opportunity. I love yes, that. Yeah. <laughs> that should be a t-shirt. Yeah. And oh, and literally it just, you know, once I got that right opportunity, it opened the door to many more opportunity. I maximized it to the point where it was time for me to step up and do yeah. something different. So the more that I, and I began to serve and give back to my community, I didn't yeah. wait. I started to share my story. That juvenile facility I escaped from, I tried to escape from, well, I went back and became a positive role model and example to those kids just by sharing my story and letting them know you don't want to go to prison because this is the truth. This is the truth what goes on behind those uh, prison doors. You know, Jermaine, I want to go into because it, there, a lot of times the guys, because it's hard to get out, it's hard yeah. to get a job um, and you have to have a certain mindset what you just said, next opportunity. Did when you were when you finally got the job, did they know about you? Did they yes. know about your situation? Because I think that's one of the things that um, if you can guys that get out, they need to get good about telling their story and what happened to them and why this, why they're different, why they're better, and and they would they because of their their story, they're going to be good going forward Correct. as an employee and loyal and whatever. But uh, obviously, you got very good at that because you got employed. But then you started doing the speaking and, and engaging. And um, I've got the um, the nonprofit organizations called Unity and the Community Movement. Yeah. How did all that come about? <laughs> uh, so I got released from prison December the 9th, uh, 2010. And so as I'm serving in my community, uh, my church community, inside of juvenile correctional facilities, and even went back inside of the prison in Lance and became a mentor, uh, I was just praying and asking God one day, I said, God, what's next? What's next for my life? Uh, I know you showed me that you're going to use me to be a leader in my community and impact the prison system, but what's next? And when I turned on the news, all I seen was you know, just racism. I see, you know, just the division that was taking place in our country, uh, all these different organizations from Black mm -hmm. Lives to Blue Lives. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just seeing all of these things. And I'm like, okay, I get the message and what people are trying to say. I said, but I don't see anybody becoming unified. We're supposed to be the United States of America. But during this time, it seems as if we are the most divided country in the entire world. And so when I said, God, man, I want to impact the world. And then he showed me in a, in a vision, man, you got to start right at home. You know, the need for change is national, but we have to start right here at home. And I said, man, what is it? Unity. We need to be unified. And so when I realized that I need to work on unifying my community, I reached out to the chief of police and said, chief, I want to meet with you. I met with him. I told him the idea that I had. I shared with him that people and I, I said, people in our community need to see you and I serving together. People yes. need to see us on the front line. They need to see blacks. They need to see whites. They need to see the police department inside of the community making a positive uh, impact. And so we did the youth versus the police department uh, basketball game. Did he, did he immediately get it? I mean, oh, well, well, he looked back, you know, he, <laughs> you know, he sat in that chair like this and he kind yeah. of it, and so he started to see it. And then he already knew my reputation from back yeah. then into the man that I am uh, today that's right before him. And so yeah. he's like, all right. He said, yeah, let's he was try the right it. Voice. Yeah. 
Yeah. Let's 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 try. It, it, we can't lose by trying, but we can lose by not doing nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, a, but Jermaine, that's a big deal because I mean, you you just you picked up the phone, went and had the meeting, and yeah. and and talked him into something that was a big deal. I mean, it was yeah. it, it, it's turned into that that if this could happen all over the country, what what a different situation would have. Correct. So so what all started happening with this? Yeah, and so the day of the event came, like. You know, so the funny thing that led up to it, people was like, man, you out here passing out flyers, promoting the police, I was like, what's going on with And I was just telling them, I said, man, now nah, we're trying to bring this community together, and this is the first yeah. step. And so, you know, once once I was able to, to drown out all the music, I continued to focus on the mission and the goal. And when the day came for the event, we had 200 plus people on the north side part of Leavenworth, which is the urban part of the community. And, you know, we had the police department, fire truck came out. Uh, you know, we had the homeless community. We had children. We had rich folks came out, church leaders. So we seen, we had everybody that came out to this event. And you've seen blacks, you've seen whites, you've seen brown, you've seen all types of people in one place. No gunshots, no violence, no cursing. You know, the basketball game uh, is going on. You know, kids are having fun, laughing, high-fiving the officers. So it was a positive impact. Mm -hmm. That moment right there, people started to see that, man, this is possible. We all are unified. Man, this is mm -hmm. what unity is supposed to look like. This is what our country is supposed to look like. Man, this is amazing that this is happening right here in our own community, Leavenworth, Kansas. And a simple concept, too. Simple, simple. Yeah. Uh, bringing people together. We had food yeah. giveaways, clothes giveaways. Uh, you know, yeah. anytime you say promote free barbecue, hey, that's going to bring people <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, and at that moment, that's when individuals begin to uh, ask the question, man, who put this event on? Yeah. We need this consistently in our community. Man, have you ever thought about getting involved in politics? And that's when I was like, no, that's the yeah. devil's playground. I don't do politics. Yeah. Well, and I, the, the things that I read about you, Jermaine, it wasn't just a natural thing. I mean, what was natural was is that you became a natural leader in the community, Correct. but you weren't seeking to be no. the mayor or you weren't seeking to be in politics. Um, but I think your, um, was it your girlfriend or your wife at the time that said, yeah, maybe you should think about that? I went look at you. I see you done my, your homework on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it was actually uh, my friend, Sean Credenton. And, you know, he, he's the one that actually opened the door for me to be able to go back and type the juvenile system and become a mentor. And he said, Jermaine, the way that you serve in the community, one day you could possibly become the mayor. And mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> and literally, like, and at that moment, it's like, God checked me, like, why not? And so I, I, I called my wife right after that meeting and I shared with her uh, what, what this man had said. And she said, well, babe, possibly you can. And I'm like, mm -hmm. man, like, so, you know, I'm five foot two. She had me feeling like I was seven <laughs> feet tall at that moment when she, when she said that. And so, but it, it gave me hope and it reminded me, you know, don't, don't limit yourself. You know what yeah. I mean? Like what God yeah. has for you is for you and nobody can take that away. And that's when I began to, uh, you know, prepare myself for what was ahead. And, and I knew at that moment that God had much more greater things in store for me. And I learned this a long time ago. If you serve to make a difference, the position will come. Because yes. when that word was spoken to me at that time, you know, it wasn't until two years later until I really started to pursue uh, the political position. Yeah, that's really something. And I, I'm curious because... I've never had anybody on here. I mean, I everybody that I have on here has, has had some event with with uh, going to prison. But as you ran for mayor, did did that become an issue? That you, hey, that other guy, hey, that guy went to prison. So look, it wasn't an issue in the uh, uh, until the results came out during the primary. It was like eleven people that ran in the primary, and so yeah. when the results came out. You know, boom, I'm in first place. And so <laughs> everybody was like, hey, who the heck is this? <laughs> you know what I mean? Who's this guy? Yeah. And so, and it was the elite group 
uh, that was asking the questions. And so as they began to dig into my background, uh, that's when they was like, hey, like this guy been to prison and all of this, like what's what's really going on? And that's yeah. when individuals started to write negative uh, articles to the newspaper and saying, no, oh, is, is he's, if he becomes a leader in our community, you know, he has a criminal record. Is he going to be biased? Is he going to be able to make the right judgment calls? Is he going to support our law enforcement? Me. Well, mm -hmm. you know, that's stuff starting to hurt my feelings a little bit. Sure, sure. I mean, that's <laughs> not fun. Yeah. And then that's when individuals started to speak up on my behalf and yeah. say, this man. Because you'd earned it. You know? yeah, I mean, this, it wasn't like you just showed up on the scene. You had earned that all the way exactly. through. You had connected the community and connected the law enforcement yep. and connected the unity. So you had that back and you just had that brought it all forward. Yeah. And so yeah. And, it, and it felt good that individuals were speaking up those positive things on my behalf. And then the newspaper posted an article that I did several years before where I shared my journey and my story. And they said, how are you going to tell on a man for being open and honest about himself? Like yeah. anything that you're trying to use that's negative, well, he's already came out and said it. Yeah, and so, totally transparent, right? Yeah, exactly. and so they said, we need an honest person in politics. <laughs> <laughs> it's something new, man. Yeah. yeah, and so the funny thing about it, so when it started, like it shifted and, and now it started getting support from everywhere, business owners, I mean, yeah. everywhere. And then all of a sudden, that's when it was like, when they couldn't find my criminal record because they started to do the digging. I forgot to mention my criminal record actually got expunged. And so, yeah, I saw that, 2015 yeah. or something. Yeah. Yep, yep. And so that's when they started to ask the question, is he just making up this prison story? <laughs> <laughs> to get elected. <laughs> Who wants to make up a prison story? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> and so by then, that's when I knew. I said, man, you stay focused. Don't allow this to distract you. Uh, remember what you're doing it for and who you're doing it for. And, you know, when that time came for me to get elected, I received the most votes and came in first place. Uh, the support from the community was there. And, you know, it was it was just amazing. A great feeling. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, just, it's just a great story. You know, I mean, when I when I heard this and, I, and Jim told me about it, I said, wait a minute. What? Wait, wait, what happened? He's yep. the mayor. And, and then when I started looking at it, it all made sense. I mean, every step that you made, I can so see how people would get behind you because you're a positive force. Yep. And because of everything that happened to you before, it even makes it more authentic you become maybe the most authentic guy in the room because you're not hiding anything. Everything's open. And, yeah. and because of your experience, you're uniquely qualified to say, hey, why don't you talk to this guy and this, Correct. Guy, this girl, talk to this girl and everybody come together because it makes more sense because you've lived it. Correct. And, and you're at the table. You're at the table talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're at the table. Hey, I'm at the table with my legs swinging. <laughs> 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 Biggest man in the room at five two. Yeah, man. <laughs> so, Jermaine, what do you like? Where do you go from here? Are you? Is this the thing that fills you up, and you're going to continue to do more of this? Is this Jermaine Wilson on the on a crusade to continue to unite and build, or what? What's kind of in your mind now? Uh, so, so my goal now is to really touch the hearts of the people in the world and open the eyes of the people in the world to let people know just because individuals make a mistake doesn't mean they don't deserve a second chance. We all fall short in life. And I tell yeah. people, instead of falling backwards, learn to fall forward. When you fall forward, you acknowledge your mistakes, you learn from them, you grow forward and you move on with your life. And so it's really just to touch the hearts of people and let them know at the end of the day, we are all human. We all need each other and we all have to become united in order to be able to create the positive change that is needed throughout our nation. Uh, and so with me sharing my story, I really wanted to touch the hearts of people and let people know, man, at the end of the day, we're, we're all human beings. We're all trying to figure it out. We all need each other. So true, man. And, and I know that what I was reading here, that uh, the book um, from Lawbreaker to Lawmaker, I love the title of that. Yeah. <laughs> that is fantastic. Yeah. From Lawbreaker to Lawmaker. Is that is that available on Amazon? No, not yet. So it's going to be okay. available by the summertime. Uh, okay. And that title came from the uh, it was a, 
a news anchor. She did my story and she- That was the headline? <laughs> yeah. And it. I said, ma'am, can I use that for my book? She said, please go ahead. From lawbreaker <laughs> to lawmaker. I love it. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Jermaine, that, that book will be out in the summertime. Okay. Yes, sir. And I will notify I, you as soon as it come out. And if people want to go and learn more about you, where, where's the best place to go? Oh, gosh, you can actually go to YouTube. You could type in Jermaine Wilson Mayor. Uh, you can actually, uh, if you want to reach out to me directly, just to have a conversation, or if you want me to come and speak at any type of venue, uh, jwilsoninspiring at gmail.com. Uh, that's my email. Or if you want to get involved in Unity in the Community, unityincommunity.org. And so, you know, we're, man, we're always trying to be a blessing and give back. Or if you want to go to my social media Facebook page, type yeah. in Jermaine you're, I, I checked it all out, Jermaine. You're hey, everywhere, look, man. Hey, two short in parentheses. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, too. <laughs> hey, I always ask people this, Jermaine, because, uh, and you kind of led into it right before I asked you about the book. Out of everything that you've gone through, what do you think's been your biggest takeaway out there to tell the listeners of what you've lived to pay it forward? Ask that question again. What do you think is your biggest takeaway from everything that you've been through out there for the listeners to, to, to maybe learn something from what you've learned? I'm, I'm gonna sum it up in a quote. Don't be okay. influenced by the negative things that are around you, but be inspired by what's inside of you. Greatness lies within each one of us but we have to dig from within. If we don't come from within, we'll go without. Don't be afraid to be who God has called you to be. That is why he is the mayor. Right there. <laughs> I love that. That is a perfect way to sum up this interview. I mean, I, I I've been so excited. I've been telling everybody, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interview the mayor of Leavenworth and you won't believe yeah. the story. So we got it out, Jermaine. I love it. And, uh, for those listening, love the likes on the social media, the comments. If you go to uh, Apple, leave a review. That's a big deal. It's also great if you follow. You can go up to those three lines there and hit the follow on Apple or on Spotify. You can hit the bell to follow. It'll just you know, that, that makes it easy for the show. Uh, just comes up for the new shows. Uh, if you want to leave me a message, BrickCassie.com, leave me a message there. I love to go back and forth with people on uh, what their thoughts are. And uh, let's see. And and, and uh, by the way, I got the, uh, the shout out to the 200 prisons out there. There's 735 tablets and it's on Edovo. Shout out to you guys. I bet you'll love this, this, uh, this, this show right here with Jermaine Wilson. As I used to say uh, when I was doing my emails from Leavenworth, stay strong. I'll do the same. Jermaine Wilson, thank you so much, man. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it, man. God bless you.